On March 5th, 1995, an exhibition called War of Extermination, Crimes of the Wehrmacht, 1941-1944, opened in Hamburg. Upon its opening, it aroused widespread interest in German society as a whole and led to an intense controversial discussion about the extent to which Wehrmacht soldiers were involved in the systematic murder of countless Soviet prisoners of war, partisans and civilians during the Eastern Campaign. For opponents of the exhibition, War of Extermination was less a scientifically based illustration of exemplary events in World War II, but rather a blanket denigration of all German soldiers. Conservative former Wehrmacht soldiers in particular felt provoked by the exhibition, as they saw it as a personal defamation, and there were demonstrations and riots over the opening of the exhibition in Munich, Vienna and Dresden, as well as an arson attack in Saarbrücken. A bitter debate about the knowledge, participation and responsibility of the common soldiers and about the National Socialist past was conducted in the media and in the Bundestag. All in all, the exhibition brought about a nationwide confrontation with the crimes of the Wehrmacht. But how much was the Wehrmacht's war driven by Nazi ideals? How firmly was the Nazi ideology anchored in the minds of the soldiers themselves? And how did their beliefs affect their actions? These questions have kept the minds of many historians occupied ever since the Second World War ended, but reliable sources to answer these questions have long been rare. There were not enough diaries to draw representative conclusions, the field post was censored, and memoirs reveal more about the strategies of coming to terms with the past than about what happened in everyday war life. On the other hand, certain leaders of the German military worked hard to build a mythology around their conduct of the war after 1945. They tried hard to pin all the blame on Hitler and on the Nazi party's paramilitary wing, the SS. But how much of this holds true now, 75 years later? If there's one thing I noticed from my old videos on the Generation War miniseries, is that there's still a lot of debate on the German army's role in the Holocaust and the ideals that was prevalent among them, also referred to by some as the Clean Wehrmacht myth. The legend of the Clean Wehrmacht assumes that the German soldiers waged a conventional war in both the West and the East during the Second World War. The German military dutifully and honorably defended the Vaterland in a fair and decent struggle. Therefore, the Germans could rightly be proud of their Wehrmacht. The degrading and inhumane treatment of the Soviet prisoners of war, the indiscriminate and countless shooting of the civilian population and the dealings with the partisans, had all originated exclusively from the SS and the special task forces who operated in the rear of the advancing forces. The Wehrmacht was claimed not to be responsible for these crimes and protested several times when they were directly confronted with individual crimes. In the Clean Wehrmacht myth, the Wehrmacht is not only acquitted of all crimes of the Eastern Campaign, but is also in itself a victim of National Socialism, which Hitler abused and betrayed in order to be able to enforce his criminal plans. The Clean Wehrmacht myth had a history long before any discourse or public debate took place about it, however. Even during the Second World War, the Wehrmacht itself tried to cover up its crimes. The deliberate concealment of their actions suggests that the soldiers knew their guilt, which eyewitness testimonies claim was done out of fear for reprisal from Soviet soldiers. There were special language regimes that turned crimes into purges and evacuations, and the criminal orders were largely passed on orally to the subordinates and covered up in the files as necessary actions against partisans. Additionally, care was taken to ensure that few witnesses were present at the executions, or that evidence such as photographs was prevented. It was also strictly forbidden for the soldiers to mention anything of this in their letters to their homeland. However, all these measures could not prevent the crime from becoming known not least because many soldiers did not adhere to the prohibitions on photography and to secrecy. Regardless of the motives for capturing the crimes in words and pictures, it is certain that the letters and photos today represent powerful counter-evidence for the legend of the clean Wehrmacht. 
Immediately after the end of the war, there was still no fixed image of the Wehrmacht in German society. But the official impetus for the legend of the Clade Wehrmacht was given by Admiral Karl Dönitz on May 9, 1945. In addition to the announcement of the end of the war, the key terms that will later characterize the myth already surfaced then. The Wehrmacht fought heroically and honorably against a superior force. Even the war opponent recognized the unique achievement with respect so that the German soldiers look back upright and proud of their achievements. The first fundamental studies on the Wehrmacht come from Helmut Krausnick, Hans Adolf Jakobsen and Andreas Hilgrüber. In 1965, Hilgrüber explains that in 1941, Hitler made the army an instrument of his racial ideological war of annihilation, which consciously denied the military norms of traditional warfare. According to Hilgruber, the military was primarily guilty of not having raised any objections to Hitler's extermination policy when it learned of his goals in 1941. Having said that, the army had been content with only rarely using the controversial Commissar Order and the Barbarossa Decree, since the violence demanded would have turned the Russian people too much against the Germans. Hilgruber points out that the extent to which these orders were carried out was controversial since no detailed investigations were available in 1965. Now, for starters, it's certainly worth recognizing that even the German army was not a unitary organization. There were estimated to be some 13 million Germans who served in the army during the Second World War, and certainly not all of them did so with the same sentiments or for the same reasons. Just as our modern day society is divided into many different political and cultural camps, so too was the German army an institution with many different ideas and by no means a unified entity. With the tight control that the Nazi state held over its people, however, it's long been difficult to surmise what the thoughts of the individual soldiers were. It was always incredibly difficult to say anything about the thinking within the Wehrmacht itself. There was almost always censorship by the Nazis, and fear of speaking out also played a role. An important discovery in the study regarding individual soldiers' thinking was made in 2001, however, when the Mainz historian Sönke Neitzel accidentally came across a bundle of unexplored files in the British National Archives, containing thousands of pages of secret wiretapping records from three British prisoner of war camps near London. As it turned out, since 1939, British American allies had special internment camps, where conversations of German prisoners of war were secretly tapped and transcribed using hidden microphones. It resulted in a huge archive containing 150,000 pages of eavesdropping reports and reports of interrogations of several thousand regular Wehrmacht soldiers. This source material is the most substantial and comprehensive collection of testimonies of German soldiers from the Second World War known to date. In terms of content, the Allied wiretapping reports as a historical source for the Wehrmacht mentality were unparalleled. Field mail was often determined by censorship and self-censorship. Diaries have survived only from small, educated minority. Official Wehrmacht reports merely reflected the views of the military leadership, and memoirs tell more about the strategies and cycle of memory than about the remembered events themselves. In comparison, the eavesdropping reports are largely free of such source problems. They were created shortly after the events themselves, during the war, or sometimes even just a few weeks after the capture of the wiretapped soldiers. Their significance lies in the openness with which the Germans spoke here. It proved to be a sensational find, as it gives today's historians an unfiltered insight in the thoughts of the German soldiers. Ever since that time, Sönke Neitzel published his findings in a book called Soldaten, on fighting, killing and dying. Fellow researcher Felix Römer wrote another book around the same time, called Comrades, the Wehrmacht from Within. Some of this material is highly personalized. Of the 3,451 soldiers that were held in the Fort Hunt secret interrogation camp near Washington between 1942 and 1945, there were records kept of 3,300 of them. They contain interrogations by the US officers, secretly eavesdropped room conversations, interviews on political views, 
and personal files in which the war and pre-war careers of the prisoners were recorded. In contrast to previous studies that regarded mostly anonymized statements made by former German soldiers, Römer was therefore able to establish connections between biography, political stance and attitudes towards war and violence. In Soldaten non fighting, killing and dying, Neitzel concluded that the Nazi ideology played no holes in the actions of the soldiers. One did not need to be an anti-Semite to murder Jews at the shooting pits, nor did a lack of hatred of Jews prevent one from becoming a mass murderer. It didn't even take much to get used to committing atrocities. Some normal men would even have found pleasure in killing within a few weeks. The harsh conclusion was that there is a beast in every human being that strikes as soon as circumstances allow it to be let out. It was not the soldiers' intentions that were decisive, but the war itself. They are dangerous people. I've shot some Jews there. Why shot? Every German soldier, with the help of the German police. In these cities, they were also beaten down and had to stand in the street. There are pigs among the Germans, and there are pigs among the Jews. They're also good Jews. I mean, they're also racial people. The foreigners must also know that so many Jews were shot. They must also know that. How did you shoot them? With a machine gun. I believe that they would be lined up that everyone had to shoot one. I was told by someone who was there. At three o'clock in the night, they drive into the forest far outside the city. They also ask them if they want anything else. Then they drive them half-dressed into the woods. We could always hear the shooting at four or five o'clock in the night. It is done around that time so that no one can see it. Then they stand there, these men, and they have to undress down to their shirts and line up. That's not right either. If we lose the war, the Jews will pay us back for everything. Oh, how bad. In our city, they took the Jews out of the shops, women and girls, everything. Put them bold and left them like that, and then led them through town. Russian is not human, but we also have wild animals. Twenty times worse than they think. Many think it's propaganda. They'll get us back for everything we did. Hundreds and thousands of innocent men, women, and children murdered. We can't help it, my child. Could these poor Jews help it, that they were being murdered? Tell me! No, that's the sad thing. Yes, that is sad. This conclusion was both worrying and reassuring. Worrying because it revealed that even the most appalling violence can become normalized at any time, if necessary or allowed. Yet reassuring, because in the end it almost seemed as if the average soldier had basically nothing to do with National Socialism, as if he had become innocent. Ideology and action were separated from one another. Römer's study, on the other hand, showed how situational constraints and ideological goals work together in war. Above all, he takes a detailed look at one group in particular, the platoon leaders. In an interview, Römer said, it was a secret of the Wehrmacht's success that military leaders could also act very independently on the lower levels, and thus often created the situation in which the soldiers acted. Platoon leaders could, as Homer points out in the protocols issued to the troops during the war, prevent or force crimes and unleash or contain violence. They were the masters of life and death. An above average proportion of them belonged to a group that Römer called intrinsic warriors, men who had made Hitler's war their own and who did not just fit into the structures of the military because command and obedience or social coercion required it. There were many ardent Nazis among them. In the form of such ideologized troop leaders, the German warfare received a national socialist influence not all of them needed to be national socialists in order to view the fight as a war of worldviews. So then, how did the Nazi worldview shape the millions of men who served in the Wehrmacht during the war? One German soldier who had just returned from an interrogation was recorded saying to his cellmate, He started with the Hitler system, etc. I think, kiss my ass. I have no idea about the systems, nor do I care. To which his comrade replied, I know that when you come home and have a bottle of beer, your work and your family, all politics suck. Most of the soldiers at Fort Hunt turned out to be apolitical. 
This indifference, however, argues Homer, did not necessarily mean neutrality, but favoured conformism. Those who did not have an opinion of their own, conformed themselves all the more to what was socially prescribed. Therefore, thinking apolitically did not prevent them from internalising national socialist values, even if one could not strictly recite them in Nazi jargon. As Homer puts it, that the soldiers did not use the term master race or subhuman and spoke more of Russians than of Bolsheviks does not mean that they would not have oriented themselves to ideologically imprinted images of the enemy. In a survey from Fort Hunt, 90% of the soldiers said that they had negative sentiments regarding the Soviet Union, while only a quarter spoke negatively about Britain. The majority of men were only superficially politicized, but at times, deeply ideologized. This conformism turned out to be a decisive factor in Homer's studies. The conformism of those who endured a long period of violence on the front lines turned out to be different from that of recruits who were deployed in the final years of the war. The younger soldiers, who were polished by Nazi institutions from an early age, turned out to be far more willing to adapt to the rules of a war of extermination than those from an older generation. These are the real butchers. I know not only from Russian sources that 60,000 Jews were killed in Kiev. A Nazi beamed with joy and told me that after the invasion of a Romanian city, Hungarian troops killed 20,000 Jews on German orders within three days. Men, women, and children shot into a pile and the others had to watch. Ugh, to what extent we have sunk. They should not even dare recount it. They should be ashamed of themselves. During the World War, the Germans fought decently, but this time our reputation has been destroyed. The Wehrmacht's war, according to Römer, was Nazi right down to its microstructures, which does not mean that the ideology led to action according to a simple cause and effect scheme. Many perpetrators did not become murderers out of Nazi convictions, but instead had their worldview shaped in the sense of Nazi ideology through their murderous acts. Incidentally, his investigation also supports a whole series of assumptions that have already been established in previous Nazi research, such as the War of Extermination Exhibition in Hamburg. The theory, for example, that the soldiers who were on the Eastern Front must have known about the Holocaust, and the realization that all sorts of criminal orders were being obeyed in all sorts of Wehrmacht units but also the realization that it usually took a certain phase of violent socialization to produce men who murdered stubbornly, callously, or even with pleasure. An important conclusion in Römer's work is that the German army had a relatively strong martial ethos. Fighting spirit, sacrifice, and camaraderie were probably more self-evident in the Wehrmacht than in other armed forces. The amount of willing fighters was undoubtedly high in the Wehrmacht, not only because of the military tradition that prevailed in civil society, but also because of the years of commitment to the front, where the core of the army could continue to mature. A second conclusion is that although the military was part of a strong ideological Nazism, the army was not ideologized to every fiber of its being. The Fort Hunt wiretapping report showed that many of the common soldiers were barely politically aware. At the same time, however, Another conclusion was that the sense of loyalty of the Germans was extremely high. Many soldiers stood behind Hitler until the last moment. Not because of an ideological motivation, but because of their relatively great sense of duty. Römer's book is important because it shatters the myth of the fanatical, purely ideologically inspired German fighter. The amount of soldiers stirred up by anti-Semitism or political ideology were only a small minority, according to Römer. The majority of the military was driven by fighting spirit and self-sacrifice. It can be argued against this, and Trümmer himself acknowledges this, that the only problematic thing about this conclusion is that there's no comparison material with, for example, the French or the English army. The only comparable research that has been done in this subject in the Second World War has been with Italian soldiers, who were also tapped. In comparison to the Germans, they did have very different ideas. 
Sacrifice and bravery were motives that played a noticeably smaller role in the Italian army than in the Wehrmacht. According to Römer, don't blame the messengers Italians. And then, 50 or 100 men and women were hung up by the Germans and they remained hanging there for three to four days. Or they had to dig trenches and then line them up at the end of the trench and then they were shot and fell straight back into it. 50 to 100 men and more. That was retaliation, but it didn't make a difference. Oh, those were war operations. They're not really criminals. When you exterminate entire families and shoot children, etc., literally kill the family? Just drop it. Oh, don't defend them. It is nevertheless undeniable that there are some darker sides to the Wehrmacht's nature. The aforementioned violent socialization is further investigated in the book The Doctrination of the Wehrmacht by Preisait who seeks to investigate the connection between the military's ideological education program and the criminal actions on the battlefield. To accomplish this, he reaches back into the early days of the Nazi regime to examine the nature of indoctrination within the Wehrmacht, and how the conditioning that soldiers received helped to create the context for their involvement in atrocities. Seid argues that schooling and Nazi values became a central pillar of Wehrmacht training by the mid-1930s, earlier than many scholars have assumed. Using documentation from its leadership, pamphlets, training materials and letters from soldiers, Seid seeks to show that the Wehrmacht's engagement in atrocities on the Eastern Front in particular was a logical extension of its long-standing ideological training program. Soldiers and officers and especially Germany's young men had been exposed to various sources of Nazi propaganda as they grew up in the Third Reich since the early 1930s. In contrast to other authors, who have emphasized the importance of indoctrination that young men received even before entering the military, or authors who believe that it was only during the war with the Soviet Union that the Wehrmacht truly embraced the Nazi worldview, State argues that the military developed a comprehensive program of ideological education within the first years of Hitler's rise to power that greatly influenced its modus operandi. State opens his analysis by examining the nature of the relationship between the military and the Nazi regime after Hitler's appointment as Chancellor. State points to the officer corps' long-standing tradition of anti-Semitism, anti-communism, right-wing authoritarian leanings and hatred of the Versailles Treaty to explain why the army quickly discarded its apolitical mantle and intensified its ideological education in classrooms. And during the war itself, according to Seid, the Wehrmacht's propaganda materials became more and more indistinguishable from the messaging embraced by the SS. Many soldiers' worldview was warped through factors such as the control of information, the individualization, and the dehumanization of the enemy, all within a stressful, authoritarian environment. In the heat of the battle, Seid argues, soldiers naturally fall back on the ideological reference points provided by their institutions to guide their behavior. To explain how ideology was translated into practice in the Wehrmacht, Seid suggests that it became embedded within the army's traditions of Auftragstaktik which encouraged personnel to take a high degree of initiative as they strove to realize their commanders' intentions. And that is where, or so it seems, the heart of the issue lies. A large number of the senior officers tended to be politically conservative, ambitious, obedient, ultranationalist, anti-Semitic, and racist. As opposed to the rest of the Wehrmacht overall, this was a remarkably homogenous group they didn't see themselves as Nazis, in fact, they generally disapproved of the Nazis, but they did support Nazi goals, and they were willing to carry out Nazi policies. The generals knew that they would not simply be fighting against enemy soldiers on the front lines. They were concerned about resistance from the populace and the potential for a partisan war. They believed that the best way to fight partisans was to be extremely brutal with the civilian population in order to terrorize civilians into dropping any support for the partisans. This attitude was ratified in what became known as the Barbarossa Decree. 
With regard to offenses committed against enemy civilians by members of the Wehrmacht or its auxiliaries, prosecution is not obligatory, even where the deed is at the same time a military crime or misdemeanor. Soldiers who committed crimes against humanity were exempted from criminal responsibility, even if they committed acts punishable according to German law. A strict violation of international law, but a military necessity to the general staff. So even though they did not consider themselves Nazis, they were willing to commit terrible crimes in order to win this war by any means necessary. As shown by some of the earliest studies into the clean Wehrmacht myth by historians such as Krausnick, Jakobsen and Hillgruber, there were already many arguments to be made against it. But a more direct public confrontation with the German perpetrator had not been possible for a long time. In the 1990s, however, a climate had developed in which it had become possible. This can be explained by the political changes that had taken place, but also because the offending generation had now largely died. At the end of the 20th century, a new generation had come to power that had no personal memories of the war, making it easier to broach this topic. In the new political context, space had been created for the Hamburg exhibition, giving a new dimension to the processing of the Nazi past. The exhibition and various books such as Hitler's Willing Executioners, Ordinary Germans and the Holocaust by Daniel Jonah Goldhagen set the stage for a more public debate about the perpetrators by confronting the German public with a picture of the real perpetrators. Science and academic publications had already proven that the perpetrators of National Socialist crimes could not only be found in the circle around Hitler, but now this thesis was introduced into the public debate by confronting the German people with what may just as well have been their own grandfathers. After all, was Opa suddenly a murderer? Perhaps he was just a young man hoping to go back home for his old job. But perhaps he was an indoctrinated young man who carried out his superiors' orders without question. No longer was the primeval of the Third Reich just the Nazi leadership alone. The Wehrmacht expedition and various books had at least achieved that, by giving the perpetrators a face, the last barrier in the debate about the crimes committed by the Wehrmacht was overcome. Even to this very day there is a great amount of disagreement in how much the common foot soldier is to be held responsible for the atrocities committed. Not all soldiers may have harbored Nazi political ideas, but be it knowingly or unwittingly, it's clear that the Nazi party had its claws sunk deep in the Wehrmacht and the German people's ideological thinking. And it's undeniable that, without the loyalty and dedication of the men serving in the Wehrmacht, many atrocities might have been avoided. This very month, in May 2021, Chancellor Merkel remarked in a speech, Nothing can fill the empty space left by the people who have been murdered. Nothing can take away the loss and pain of the survivors. The crimes committed do not expire. Keeping the memory alive is Germany's eternal responsibility. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. Now, I know this video didn't necessarily present any breathtaking fresh takes on the academic discourse of the clean Wehrmacht myth, but I do feel that it is important that this kind of knowledge is available publicly and freely on the internet rather than locked behind paywalls of academic papers and the sort. It seemed like a relevant topic for me to discuss considering the popularity of my Generation War video and the kind of comments that I happened to see underneath it. Anyway, if you enjoyed it, or at the very least thought it educational or interesting, do leave a comment and a like to support the channel, or better yet, subscribe. Any discussions regarding this topic are more than welcome down below, just uh, don't be a wearable about it. Alright, take care. Now see you next time.